So I just wanted to start by, 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 by sort of emphasizing Oaken, basically our mission statement is to try to use federated learning and, and artificial intelligence for precision medicine, which actually is a rather good fit to, the, uh, to, 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 to this topic. Um, I myself am an SV, SVP of strategy and business development, and I joined the company only a few months ago um, to sort of help them think about how to steer the, the, the future of the company towards engagement with a number of different kinds of, 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 of sectors, pharma companies who, who we've already been engaging with quite a lot, but also other sectors that, 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 that can take advantage of our technology. So I thought I'd start by just sort of giving you a refresher on federated learning. So the big difference between federated learning and standard machine learning is that in standard machine learning, what you tend to do is take the data from various different sources and put them together, typically in a central repository, and then expose your models to them in that central repository. The big advantage of, of aggregating data in that way is that it allows you to pull in large data sets across many different sources. And if, for example, you're looking, looking at patient data, it basically gives you a, a much more diverse and general set of, 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 of patients that you can build your models on. So it's, it's a great thing to be able to do to look at larger populations. The problem with the standard approach, however, is that transferring the data into your central repository is actually a fairly laborious process. It requires a lot of effort, it requires a lot of expense, and it actually um, runs into many obstacles. One of the major obstacles is that data security gets compromised in that process. So if you imagine that you're a hospital and you have, a, and you have thousands of patients worth of data, you will be very um, resistant to the idea of transferring that to some data science company that's going to combine them with a bunch of other patients' data. And in fact, that becomes more or less impossible if you're in Europe where GDPR reigns and, and, and essentially you, you just, it, that kind of aggregation is extraordinarily difficult to do. So one of the solutions to addressing that kind of problem is to use a federated system. And at, at the simplest level, federated learning basically means rather than moving the data to the model, you move the model to the data. So what does it mean? It basically means that all the data reside in their original repositories within each hospital behind their firewalls. And the model tra travels from one uh, from one repository to another. And in doing so, you're only exposing the model locally to each data set. And what you're preserving as you travel from one hospital to another is all the coefficients that you've learned from, from the data. So it's a way of basically benefiting from the learnings of all the different data sets, but in a way that doesn't actually expose any of the data to, 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 to anything out of their control. It, the, it's also much more efficient. Models are, 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 are much faster to transfer. It's, it, it, and, and there's all the curation work is, 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 is done locally. So you basically don't need to worry about that in, in, in the central location. The hospitals, again, retain complete control. Data security is, is, is fully maintained. And of course, this makes it much easier to be GDPR, GDPR compliant if you're putting things together. So that's sort of the one of the core technologies that we're building our capability around. Now, our federated learning, basically, is, it, it, for, for example, is being used to actually connect even drug screening data across 10 different pharmas. So this, I think, is actually a wonderful showcase example because pharma companies are famously very um, concerned about their data security, and they're, they're one of the least willing organizations to share their data with other pharma companies. Yet we've been able to, enter, to, 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 to set up a collaboration between 10 different pharma companies to basically effectively pool their screening data, their drug screening data, so that they can now build models that are, that, that are exposed to all of the drug screening data from all of the other, uh, the other 10 pharmas. And you know, these, aren't, these, these aren't little pharmas, they're all, all, all the major pharmas or a good number of the major pharmas are involved in this effort. And again, it's this same, the, 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 the same setup. The models are being built by circulating between the different pharma sets. All of the participants have access to the, to, to, to the consensus models. But of course, even all of the analyses that they do using those models are done completely within their own firewall. So essentially, um, you know, although the model has traveled to all the data sets to learn the greater context of how, of, of how, to, uh, how to make sense of drug versus target relationships, a, a particular pharma company can take that model and try that out on their own compounds and figure out what targets are likely to fit on it particularly well. And, uh, and doing it in a way that doesn't even reveal to the others what compounds they're, they're, they're interested in. Now, for in the clinical setting, we, we, we view one of the most impactful areas for, 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 for us to build out a federated, federated learning capability in the clinical space. And in order to do that, we're building out a growing clinical data network. And fundamentally what that means is many different hospitals scattered uh, ultimately over, over, over continents. Right now we're mostly in Europe. We're expanding um, decidedly into North America and, uh, and planning to expand greater in the future. And basically our objective is to take all of the major clinical modalities, so imaging of different kinds, RWE and, 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 and clinical reference data, 
um, any uh, outcomes data on molecular profiling data as well. And basically put them all together in each of the, of, of the hospital settings and set them up for a federated learning infrastructure where essentially models can travel between the sets and, 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 and pull them together. Our first example of having done this um, is the health chain network where we essentially took a, a, about 10 institutes in France and pooled all of their data together into one of these, uh, into, into one of these federated networks. And that's being used to primarily interpret um, clinical imaging data. Um, just, uh, just a few weeks ago, we announced a much larger consortium that we're putting together, which, is, uh, which now brings in uh, 16 health centers, um, the, the, the large health centers scattered throughout Europe. It's an EU funded um, effort. Um, we're also collaborating with four other, with three other technology companies and, and, and a number of analytic companies as well. And the, and the effort is being supported by six distinct foundations and advocacy, advocacy groups focused around cancer and pharma sponsors. We have, we have five major pharma sponsors involved in this as well. And the objective for this collaboration is to basically pull together patient information for four different cancer types, or for, sorry, for three different cancer types, types uh, prostate, breast, and lung cancers. And we are providing the federated learning infrastructure that sits behind the whole thing. And ultimately, this is going to create a large set of uh, and potentially hundreds of thousands of patients worth of data that could be aggregated together. So how do we use the, all this effort to advance precision medicine, you might ask? Well, for starters, the way we think about the, 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 our, our, our federated learning network is that we like to set up what we consider a, a, a data feedback loop, where we essentially have our network of connected hospitals that are, that, that are coordinating their, their, their data on us in, in a certain kind of way. We use that to essentially build artificial intelligence models that can be used to stratify those patients into subtypes and look for, uh, and look for, look for outcome uh, look to, to, and, and make outcome predictions. Those are quite useful for the clinics. If we convert those models into diagnostic tools that allow them to understand the, 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 the likely fates of their patients with, with, with more precision, we can then feed those back to the hospitals and that will encourage them to engage more of their programs and actually recruit other hospitals into our network. So over time, we're, we're, we're building out our, our, our federated network at a, at a pretty impressive rate. So what do we do with this, with, with this data feedback loop once we have it? Well, one thing that we can do is pull out advanced subtyping data, which essentially says if you have a large heterogeneous group of, say, lung cancer patients, you can look at all of the differences that you're observing across the different mod data modalities and cluster them into subtypes that have different things going on. The different things could be different mechanisms, they could be different phen phenotypes that you observe in their images, they could be different treatment profiles or, or, or other qualities in their medical records. But all of that can be broken out into distinct groups that are fundamentally different from each other. What's useful about subtypes is that within a subtype, if you've actually separated out the patients that look like each other into that subtype, you can expect to have more homogeneity of biological signal within the subtypes than you find in the broader population. And that allows you to start looking for targets for, 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 for new drugs in a, in a much cleaner way. And uh, essentially that can then be used to repurpose existing drugs, um, do drug combinations for subtypes or do new targets or, or look for new, new, new targets within, within those subtypes. Another useful thing that you can do is take those AI models and use them to optimize drug development. So for example, you can take uh, large collections of external RWD uh, the, 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 of your data and use them for external uh, control arms for people's clinical trials. So if you're a pharma company that wants to work with us, what you could do essentially is see whether within our Oaken loop, we can discover groups of patients who look somewhat like your, like what your control arm of your, of your trial should be. And if, they, if, you could, if we can find enough patients with, with similar enough qualities, we can use that for you to know, the, to, 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 to spare your patients from having to be in control arms. That helps a lot with, um, with, with, with trial efficiency. It can speed up trials a lot. And it, can be, and it spares patients a lot of pain of having to go through um, control treatment when they could be taking the experimental drug. The other thing that you can do with this is precision trial enrollment. So if you have determined subtypes uh, of, of, of the patients, those subtypes are likely to have biomarkers that separate them into their own particular subtype. And that can be used to direct those patients towards a drug that's more likely to work for them. Opening up the, opening up the possibility of basket trials where patients, rather than being all tried, all can, you know, all lung cancer treatment patients being tried on a particular drug, you can now take those lung cancer patients with the right genetic or other predisposition for that drug to, 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 to be chosen for that drug and, and, and sent to that trial. And that allows you, that gives you, again, um, the ability to run faster trials because your signal will be clearer and so you can have smaller cohorts. 
it, it, it allows the, 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 the patients to not waste their time on treatments that don't work for them. And it allows the 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 pharma company to operate the whole thing much more much more efficiently, and and you'll have higher higher, higher response rates within with, with any precision trial. And finally, one thing that you can do is essentially apply machine learning methods on the data that are coming out of the trials and use that to to, to extract clearer to, uh, uh, trial analysis uh, analyses. And I have examples of that coming up. So, what what is this artificial intelligence that we're applying? to try to pull out um, the, to, to pull out useful phenotypes. So one thing that we're doing is building biomarkers for precision oncology from routine images. So one of the things that we're very motivated in doing is taking um, routine uh, um, screening data that are used for, for cancer patients and using that to figure out what sub subtype they might belong in. And one of the most common routine um, uh, 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 um, diagnostics that are run on people is to have a standard HNE pathology image. You basically take a slice out of someone's tumor, um, stain it with a couple of, of, of stains that reveal the cellular biology in a, in a fairly clear way. And since it's so standard, a large fraction of cancer patients out there get these HNE uh, 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 scans done on their tumors quite routinely. And that's extremely helpful because essentially what, what they use right, used for primarily right now is pathologists look at them and use that to basically estimate the prognosis how well is the patient going to do but there's all there's an awful lot of biological information in there that could actually be interpreted um obviously by a pathologist but if you can use artificial intelligence to basically do the same kind of analysis trained by what the pathologists say it allows you to do it much more efficiently and it's interesting many people um like to advertise artificial intelligence as a way to replace pathologists, I completely view that as a ridiculous way to present things. Instead, I think pathologists will, essential, will be essential for all analyses of cancer going forward. But the real problem with, with pathology analyses is that pathologists are a very limited resource. Limited resource. Um, most patients who have HNE scans run on them don't have the opportunity for a lot of analysis from pathologists. So many images are collected and they basically aren't, aren't, aren't examined very well. With artificial intelligence, you can basically use ways to split the patients out into the obvious distinctions that, are, that can be called on from an image and then leave to the pathologists the hard questions that need to be resolved. So on the left hand side, we're showing an example where, where, where we put together a, a network of mesothelioma patients and basically built AI models off of, the, off of the images that looked for morphological and cell distribution features in the images to predict, to, to, to uh, stratify patients into those that are likely to have a very uh, rapid progression and those who will have a slower progression, which is extraordinarily helpful for understanding the, understanding the treatment of those patients. On the right-hand side, we've taken it to the, to the next level, where basically what we've done is stratified the patients from a, uh, from, a, um, from a number of, of, of cancer types there, both by, the, uh, both, both by prognosis and by genetic states and, and, gene, and gene expression states that are visible in the tumor. So there we had both the HNE images and molecular profiling data, and we used the, the, the combination of the two to look for image features that predict the molecular profiling state. And that's extraordinarily useful. The, 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 the two kinds of states that we're looking at are the presence of, of tumor-driving muta uh, uh, tumor mutations and also the presence of immune, uh, immune system activity, two essential components of, uh, uh, for, for, uh, to, to understand for cancer treatment. And again, what this offers is the chance to do this routinely on people's on, on a lot of people's standard images. So another way that we can that, that, that we can benefit clinical trials, especially, is by clarifying clinical trial outcomes using a technique called covariate adjustment. Covariate adjustment has been uh, has been around in earlier forms for a long time, but in 2014, Kahan uh, published a paper basically looking at how you can use this kind of an adjustment technique to get to, to, to get clearer signals from a clinical trial. How does that work? Well, conceptually, the way this is done is similar to what noise cancelling headphones do when you use them on, on, on the subway to try to clarify the, 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 the music that you're listening to. So what does it actually do? Well, so, so this diagram here sort of walks you through how covariate adjust, adjustment works. Essentially, what we have is a large set of training data that, that, could, be, that, 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 that could be large collections of images. So they could be CT scans from, 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 from cancer patients or H&E stains, uh, again, those, those routine uh, scans. And we also have a lot of medical record information, which from the from real world sources would be typically an electronic health care uh, health record, or from a clinical trial would be an ECRF, which is a, a, a case report form. And uh, in both cases, you can basically build models 
that, that can predict the patient outcomes based on, on on large sets of training, large training sets where we knew what the where we had measured the outcomes, and we have all all these image and, and and medical features. Once you have those models, you can now use them to make predictions for new data sets that might not have the outcomes already. And so, essentially, uh, to, towards the right hand in the pink, what you see is how we then apply these models. We apply them then to the trial data that might come from our our, our pharma partner. So they would essentially have their own from their from their own trial. They'll have a number of CT scans and they'll have HNE scan the stains and they'll have ECRFs. When we apply the model, we well before you apply the model from all of those data they've collected, they can basically generate a, 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 a they, they can basically analyze their their the outcomes that come out of their trial. So what would be the outcomes? The outcomes for a trial for a cancer trial would essentially be uh, something like an overall survival rate or a, uh, a, a progression-free survival time, how long did the, did the patients carry on without, uh, without having a problem, or they could also be things that are measuring the, the, the reduction in size of the tumor under treatment. All of those are outcomes, and those get measured in the results of a trial. The problem with those outcome measures is that they're, they're, they're basically confounded by a lot of, 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 of other factors that control how their outcome might look. Some patients inherently have worse prognosis, other patients are, 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 are have their data measured in, 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 in uh, with different equipment that will lead to strange biases. And all of those things can be described by the kind of model that we had trained looking at much larger sets of, of information. So essentially what you can, you, you can use the model to go in there, look at what those covariates are, apply corrective adjustments, similar to what a noise canceling headphone does with the background noise, and then refines the outcome measures before you then try to look at the difference between your treated and your controlled distribution. And as a result of that, of applying that approach, you can take a fairly blended, a fairly overlapping pair of distributions between control and treated, the control and treated, and tighten them up to a narrow range. Because you've basically made adjustments for your, to, to, to your outcomes based on the biological noise that you understand from the, from the covariate model. Uh, the, the, this is actually so we, we we've done a study of this to to, to see how how effective this might be on a, on on, on a, a, a typical clinical trial. And for this, we used uh, Merck's uh, uh, Merck's Keytruda trial, which they published and made the data available for in recent years. The, the, the Keynote three hundred seven file uh, a trial. So this has has uh, uh, about a thousand patients that have been treated by a uh, by a checkpoint inhibitor. And they had a number of different outcomes. And essentially, using uh, applying the covariate adjustment method, we were able to show that if we had kept the number of, of patients the same, we would get eight percent more statistical power by, by after applying the adjustments. And if we instead reduce the number of patients to maintain the same the, the, the same statistical power, we could get away with fifteen percent fewer patients. And that is a substantial savings on a trial like this that that, that, that cost many millions to, to to run and could be dramatically um, impactful for large phase three trials where you're trying to run, to, to look at tens of thousands of patients in, in often very expensive protocols. Um, the, this method is gaining increasing acceptance from the, from the regulators. Both the EMA and the FDA have published uh, strongly supportive guidance on applying this, me this methodology to improve your, your trial outcomes. And uh, in addition to that, of course, Okin has been, has been very active in a number of different areas applying artificial intelligence to different to, to, to different problems that, that, that have interesting impact. Um, and uh, here's just a snapshot of a few um, prominent articles that have come out. Um, the thing that's worth noting here is that while most of our work has actually been in the in, in the, uh, the, the the imaging of the, the cancer imaging space, we also have been um, branching out into other disease areas. And interestingly enough, in uh, earlier this year, published a paper uh, a paper looking at, um, at likely outcomes for COVID-19 patients. Based on studying imaging qualities, so uh, and quality uh, properties of their image uh, of images, routine lung images. So the bottom line that, are, that, are, that I'm hoping you'll step away from for, for, from this talk is that Okin basically are a biotech company that combines a growing data network with federated learning and artificial intelligence to advance precision medicine. And with that, I'm, uh, I'd like to thank you for, for for your attention. And if you have any further questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. Thank you so much, Joseph. Uh, a really interesting talk. Um, I I do have a couple of questions that um, that I hope you could um, you could you could just help me understand a, a little bit better. So um, so you started off talking about um, about federated learning, and one of the things I wondered is um, because you're learning coefficients um, and you're moving them out of the facility, you're moving them out of the 
um, out of the hospital or you've learned them. Could it be plausible that a really complicated model um, with lots of coefficients, for example, something based on neural networks could actually learn enough to be able to breach patient privacy? So would you, in principle, would you be com completely comfortable publishing all the coefficients that you've learned? And you know, are you, would you be certain that there is no risk of data privacy, even if they were open source um, af after learning, or or is there still a concern? Oh, I, I, th I think there's always a concern that you might be able to infer individual qualities from a model that's built in a federated or a non-federated case. However, the the way that the, 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 that most people try to address this is to make sure that the resolution of the model that that, that is ultimately made available is coarse enough that you always have a enough individual's data in any coefficient that you're looking at that you can't dissect it out for an individual for a particular individual but honestly this is always going to be a limitation that you'll have for any kind of model building it's it's a trade-off that you have to deal with right i mean uh, and it's electronic medical records have exactly the same problem um people are collecting are, are, are increasingly moving their their medical records into an, electro, an electronic setting which allows you to get treated much more effectively and actually is a, a major advance in healthcare but it does expose all of us to a lot more to, 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 to a lot more public access to our information, which can in fact be used by 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 different um, by, by people who won't be by organizations that might not be, have their best interests at heart. However, um, the way I think of it is is in relative terms. Any model will have this kind of problem. A federated model is less exposed to this than others because you naturally control both the 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 the, the access that the model has to the data, and you can control the access of the model to others. So if, if, if you look at the Melody collaboration, for example, the only people who have access to the Melody model that's been built across all of them are the pharma participants who have actually put the mm -hmm. things together. And they also have an mm -hmm. academic group that they're, that they're working with to do the model interpretation. And so those that limited set of people has access to the models. It will be very hard for anyone else to be able to infer anything about even the collective drug screening set if they're not part of that consortium. And similarly, if you look at, if you look at the health chain network that we've set up in our clinical settings, um, the our health chain uh, participating companies have, they know everything about their own patients. They have a general view of what's happening to the other patients from the, from, from the, uh, the, the model coefficients, but it would be very hard for them to infer anything about the other patients. And because it's a federated system, we don't have the core vulnerability of, uh, that, that many data aggregators have. So if you look at a typical aggregating company, the, in the US you see many more of these, um, where they actually bring medical records in curate them and have a central repository of all of those, that is a much greater risk because if the if, if, if their processes for controlling data security are flawed in, in any way, that is a much more um, much greater breach of patient patient privacy than you'd ever have in a federated system. Hmm, I see. Yeah, no, that's a that's a that's a good that's a good way to approach this. But essentially you would need to keep both um, yep. both you both both the both the data and the coefficients are our, our privacy, privacy, our, our privacy sensitive. But the coefficients are a, mo are a lot less risky because yeah. they are ag they're, they're consensus qualities of relatively large populations. And mm -hmm, you can adjust mm -hmm. how precise that is. So, so, so given that, that, that there is a lot of biological noise in, 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 in any clinical data set, we will only have useful models if we aggregate um, anything into groups of 10 or more patients. I mean, that, that is very optimistic yeah, to think we can win anything on of, of 10 patients. And once you're dealing with those kinds of numbers, it becomes extremely hard to dissect what came from one patient to another, especially if you don't even know who the patients are, which of course you mm -hmm. don't because they're completely locked behind the firewalls. Uh, uh, absolutely. Um, some machine learning models are going to lend themselves a bit better um, yes. to this kind of approach than others. So for example, if you use a Bayesian, um, a Bayesian uh, model, you can essentially chain them up so you can treat your your posterior um uh, your posterior distribution and one uh, on one on, on one side as, as your prior distribution and the other side um so but at the same time i you know i imagine um uh, you know it will be fairly difficult to for example adjust a, a support vector machine uh, with in, in this kind of way so um so you know do you have any comments about the kind of selection of or maybe the perhaps limiting factors when it comes to the selection of ML, um, so, uh, you know, machine uh, I, learning models that you'd apply. So I'm too new to 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 to, to Oaken and federated learning in general to 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 give a proper technical answer on that. But but I can there, there, uh, there, there's a large uh, our, our our platform team 
has looked very deeply into these kinds of questions and can certainly give you good answers to this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's yeah. That's that's that's, that's, that's that that will be a really interesting angle of discussion. Yeah. Um, another way to solve this is, I suppose, using um, kind of like emerging tools like homomorphic encryption. Um, you know, have you have you got any views of if if this could be the future or if, if this could be a kind of interesting angle? So I, I definitely think encryption methods are essential for for, for handling mm -hmm. patient data in any case. Um, and uh, and even in a federated setting, it's it's a good idea to have everything encrypted. Um, again, the nice thing about a federated network is that though the, the encryption aspect of it really is the responsibility of the of, of the of the federated site themselves because they're the only ones who have the totality of the patient information in one place where they where they can see what's going on with their patients and it's limited to the information that they have about only their patients. Mm -hmm. there, there, though, I think encryption is essential. Um, the uh, I think one of the the the, the bigger challenges though that, that we'll have is making sure that that, that the data are set up in the different federated nodes in a way that they are in, that they are exchangeable. You know, you need to be exactly, to which was which was going to be my next question. Yeah. <laughs> Indeed, how do how do you make and, sure and that, that essentially they're pre-processed in the same way? Yes, and so so, so the as we as we're building our federated network, the, the the largest amount of effort that's required to mm -hmm. bring in a new node is in fact aligning the pre-processing steps to make Indeed. sure that everything is is on a comparable framework so that we can actually build models that are that, that, that are based on common features yeah I was, I was actually you know i was actually wondering so my specific, specifically the question i was wanting to ask you is um you know would would hospitals essentially have to hire consultants to to basically align that all, all of the data pre-processing to make to make it usable and then and then the question becomes if you know if the best person the best consultant to really solve this problem is actually Oaken, is it still federated learning? If you're going to let Oaken's consultants on the premises actually, um, is, is, that, is that the model that you're using or is it, um, or is it, or is it something else? So, 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 so the model that we're using is, is, is that Oaken people work with the, with, with mm -hmm. the, uh, the, the bioinformaticians at the site and mm -hmm. they are the ones who are actually applying the models and who are, and who are actually doing their data curation mm -hmm. and guidance mm -hmm. on it. Um, we, we might have um, access to their files while they're doing the, 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 the uh, you know, we, we might enter into their firewall and have a chance to sort of help guide them through the process of setting up their, their, their curation processes, but we never actually transport the data and it's, and unless yeah. we're able to memorize millions of patients worth or thousands of patients worth of, of individual data points in our heads, and there's very little risk that they'll be, that the, the security will be breached. <laughs> how, how many coefficients can you store in your brain, Joseph? <laughs> um, I, I believe the answer is about seven. <laughs> <laughs> number recall. <laughs> makes sense. Makes sense. Joseph, thank you so much for being here um, and and coming to the conference. Uh, it was a great talk. Um, we do have to move on to the next speaker. Cool. Um, I'm looking forward to interacting with you in the future. Thank Absolutely. you so much. And likewise. Thank you, Adam.